Welcome to the Psychology Podcast, where we give you insights into the mind, brain, behavior, and creativity. I'm Dr. Scott Barry Kaufman, and in each episode, I have a conversation with a guest who will stimulate your mind and give you a greater understanding of yourself, others, and the world we live in. Hopefully, we'll also provide a glimpse into human possibility. Thanks for listening and enjoy the podcast. I love you. <laughs> Today, it's so great to have Corey Mascara on the podcast. Corey's an international speaker and teacher on the topics of presence and well being. He believes that when people are deeply fulfilled, <laughs> I don't think I can get through this because you just made a joke before I started. Okay, I'm going to try. He believes when people are deeply fulfilled. Why can't I? Why can't I do this? Why can't I? Why can't I do this? Why can't I do this? Okay, I'm gonna try so hard. When people are deeply fulfilled, they're a better force in the world for other beings, the environment, and their communities. For several years, he taught mindfulness-based leadership at Columbia University and currently serves as an assistant instructor of positive psychology at the University of Pennsylvania. In 2012, Corey spent six months in silence, living as a monk in Burma, meditating 14 plus hours a day, and now he aims to bring these teachings to people in a practical and usable way, presenting to schools, organizations, and healthcare systems, as well as through workshops and retreats for the general public. Named by Dr. Oz as one of the nation's leading experts on mindfulness, his meditations have now, heard, have now been heard more than 10 million million times in over 100 countries. That is truly incredible, Corey. Congrats. Corey is host of the popular daily podcast, Practicing Human, um, which I try to listen to. I can't keep up every day. I'm overwhelmed, but it's uh, amazing when I listen to it. And is the author of the new book, um, which we're going to hold up for those who um, can have the video version of this podcast, um, Stop Missing Your Life, How to Be Deeply Present in an Unpresent World. Whew, I made it through. Congrats, Corey. <laughs> Thanks, man. That was fun. That was fun. <laughs> Maybe I won't edit that at all, so people can see our 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 natural spontaneity. Oh yeah, we should just record our our <laughs> lunchtime conversations, make those into podcast episodes. Yes. Well, <laughs> oh, that would be very interesting. I don't think people realize. I mean, maybe they do, but just how oh, yeah. like, interesting you are outside of the podcast. Uh, oh. so, like how interesting your conversations are. How how curious you are as a human being. And for all those listening, maybe I'm sure others have said this, but Scott is just the most authentic, curious human I have ever met. I oh. love my time with him. Uh, totally outside of these like formal settings. Um, your what you hear on the podcast is him in real life, and it's uh, it's an honor to be back on, man. Oh, Corey, thank you so much. Um, that is that is uh, such a nice thing to say, and I know you mean it. You're a very genuine human being, as well. Um, so, uh, you know, with these kinds of chats, it's, it's always difficult for me to know like what point to start in. Do I start with you, you know, you know, meditating on the mountain or do we start, let, but let, let's start with you in, in college. I mean, weren't you a bit of like a frat boy at yeah. one point? Let's start before then. Cause people might, might in all these podcasts you're going to be doing when you're on tour, they're all going to start with your, tell me about when you were a monk. But I think it's actually a lot more interesting. The transformation from frat boy to monk to me is a lot more interesting, you know? So yeah. I- yeah. I agree. Yeah. Especially when you get into all the different parts of the self that can exactly. express different points. Exactly. Um, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I, so I think as you know, I, I got into meditation to impress a girl and there was no noble, uh, uh, uh impetus for it. That hippie girlfriend in college, she was in a meditation. I wanted her to think I was cool. Um, and so I started meditating and, uh, I made it this new year's resolution to meditate three times a week, uh, for 15 minutes a day. And I really did not know what I was doing. I would just mm. lie in my dorm room bed, have my hands on my belly, and I would be thinking, inhale, exhale, inhale, exhale. And uh, within, you know, it wasn't within that just short period of time of doing the inhale, exhale, focus practice, um, my sleep improved, my focus improved, I started feeling happier. And I, there was this, this progressive uh, maturation that was happening where um, it went from this superficial undertaking to this recognition that wow, this is a this is a practice that can not only improve my well-being, but can actually ex- help me explore my humanness more deeply and intimately. Um, but I, it it also wasn't that noble. I think I make it sound more noble in hindsight, and probably when I talk about it regularly, it, it's the memory of it is more noble than it actually was. If I really get down. Uh, and with like the the honest thread at that time, yeah. there was something very compelling to me 
about being the guy that was into meditation. I was in fraternity. I was a social chair. I was throwing a lot of parties. Um, I wasn't a terrible human being as like can sometimes happen in those yeah. ecosystems. Well, you're one of the better ones of the worst. <laughs> yeah, <I guess> that's <laughs> no, I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> and, um, I'm totally and so, joking. <laughs> I, yeah, but it, I think fair to say as well. Uh, but, you know, you're, you're exploring, I think a lot of people are exploring their identities, obviously, at any point in their lives, but especially at that age, 20, 21, 22. And I love being the idea of being the person that nobody expected to be into this, like the guy that was into, you know, throwing parties and also into meditation. There was something mysterious about it. And I still remember people being like, whoa, that's so cool. Look what Corey's into. And if I'm being totally honest, the, the first, I say, year of getting into this practice was probably heavily driven by um, the ego identity of being someone that was into meditation, which mm-hmm. tons of irony there. I had enough awareness to catch that as a motivating force uh, for going into this work and also recognizing that at the heart of this work is probably the complete opposite intention. Mm. And um, it was that, the recognition that this is still a bit of a superficial undertaking that caused me to want to go over to Burma and take this practice much more seriously and go much more deeply and see if nobody knew I was meditating, if that identity was totally stripped from me, would I still be interested in this? Would I still pursue it? Uh, prior to Burma, I didn't know the answer to that. And afterwards, uh, there was much more clarity. Just a quick break to let you all know that this episode is sponsored by Learning and the Brain. Learning and the Brain's mission is to connect educators to the latest research in the science of learning through education conferences, summer institutes, one-day seminars, and on-site professional development. I've had the great pleasure of speaking at several of their conferences already, and they always have an amazing array of presenters. Many of them are leading national experts on psychology, neuroscience, and education. If you're an educator interested in the brain and using the learning sciences to improve your school, classroom, or practice, this is the conference for you. Learning in the Brain runs three conferences a year in Boston, San Francisco, and New York City. I'll be at their May 2020 conference in New York speaking about transcendence and self-actualization, and I hope to see you there. To find out more about Learning in the Brain's upcoming conference in May 2020 and any of their other events, please go to learningandthebrain.com. That's learningandthebrain.com. Okay, now back to the show. What motivates you now? Do you feel like it's an inverted U-shaped curve at all? Like, do you feel, do you feel like, um, like, do you feel right now just as you felt when you were on the mountain or do you feel like you've, you're, there's a deeper integration? I ask this very seriously. Like perhaps I could see a, a scenario and I don't know if this is true, but I could see a scenario where you're, you're more integrated whole person now where you've taken that old Corey and the enlightened Corey and now you're just, you know, there's not to know just about it, but you're kind of a different being that's that's more whole. I don't know. What 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 do you think about what I just said? Yeah, I think that's where our interests tend to overlap. I, I'm more interested these days in in that integration of yeah. like, uh, monk Corey and frat boy Corey. For right. Like me, me too. Yeah, me too. Yeah. yeah. Because yes, I was in a totally different headspace when I was in the monastery and connected to my heart in a different kind of way. Um, and in a really profound way and connected to awareness and consciousness and all the, all the stuff that people talk about in very romantic ways as something to work toward, but tends to be so much harder to access in day to day life. There was a really uh, strong dichotomy for me when I came back from the monastery of like, oh, that's the deep stuff, like the meditation in the monastic setting. And then there's real life. And, uh, I think the last eight or so years have been trying to integrate those two so that so that there could be a new evolution and development of depth in the real world. One that doesn't look the same because you you can't escape the distractions and the complicated family dynamics and relationship dynamics that you get in the real world that won't be triggered in the monastery. I, I worked through so much meditating 14 hours a day, but there were things related to my parents, related to relationships like certain qualities of loneliness or insecurity that could only come up in the context that triggered them. And, uh, there was a, um, following coming back from Burma, 
it was just a whole other spiritual path, if you will. And yes, I do feel like there's much more space for more dimensions of who I am now in a way that leads to a, a sense of wholeness that I didn't have before Burma. I don't think I had during Burma and only comes now having walked both of those paths a bit more intimately. I love that so much. I love it so much. I'm, I'm experimenting here with the with the colors because I look uh, very angelic. Yeah, so I really, really love that. Um, and I think that uh, you are getting you are getting there, and, and that's probably the best path. Hi, all. I'm really excited to announce that the Psychology Podcast is now being sponsored by BetterHelp, the world's largest counseling service. BetterHelp has asked me to talk to you about your mental health and how to reach out and get help. This is a topic really near and dear to my heart, so I definitely wanted to get this message across. After all, you wouldn't hesitate to go to the doctor for professional care if you had a broken arm. Your mental health deserves the same attention. BetterHealth's mission is to provide everyone with easy, affordable, and private access to professional counseling anytime, anywhere. BetterHelp will assess your needs and match you with your own counselor from their network of licensed, accredited, and board-certified therapists. It's really great because you can start communicating in just under 24 hours. It's not a crisis line, and it's not self-help. It is professional counseling done securely online. What's really cool is that there's a broad range of expertise in BetterHelp's counselor network, which may not be locally available in many areas. You know, personally, I love it. I've started seeing a counselor at BetterHelp who has helped me with my intimacy issues, and I just love how non-judgmental and professional the counselor is. Some other cool things about BetterUp is that you're not limited to the 9 to 5 of traditional therapy, and you can log in to your account anytime to send a message to your counselor. You can even schedule weekly video or phone sessions and get timely and thoughtful responses from your own personal counselor. You'll never have to sit in an uncomfortable waiting room ever again. It's clear that BetterHelp is committed to facilitating great therapeutic matches as they make it easy and free to change counselors if ever needed. Also, BetterHelp is more affordable than traditional offline counseling and financial aid is available. So look, you can get started today. Listeners of the Psychology Podcast get 10% off their first month by going to BetterHelp forward slash psych podcast again you can get started right away and enjoy 10 percent off your first month of high quality therapy by going to b-e-t-t-e-r-h-e-l-p dot com forward psych podcast that's better h-e-l-p dot com forward psych podcast okay now back to the show but um well what do you think about okay i'm gonna just throw this out there abraham maslow one of my heroes um, wrote an unpublished essay, which uh, maybe someday I'll publish it uh, for him <laughs> since he can't, um, uh, called Can Monks Ever Be Self-Actualized? And mm. he argues in this essay that they can't be because wow. actually he criticizes it a little bit. He says, you know, they to be self-actualized requires getting your butt off the mountain and and doing something in the world, you know, like, you know, making the world a better place with your your presence um, you know, like not just being this like enlightened, you know, person that just like is all in your head 24 mm. seven. Um, and I thought it was a very provocative essay. Um, what, I'm just going to say something very provocative. What if the core you are now is more, more enlightened than, uh, than you ever would have been if you stayed, a, a stayed a monk? I'm going to just put this out there. I think there's a fair argument for that. I think. It, Am I going to get in trouble? I'm going to get in trouble for saying that. <laughs> <laughs> I won't tell the monks. The monks uh, aren't watching it doing electro electric technology anyway, so they won't no, see this. Uh, yeah. It's all fun. Yeah. Um, I think the answer to that is entirely dependent on the lens through which you're asking, like, or just exploring what is enlightenment. So if if enlightenment means waking up to and integrating and not being. Um, controlled by or enslaved by certain parts of who you are or past conditionings, um, then yes, I, I do think I am more enlightened. Mm. Uh, if it's referring to a quality of, um, I don't know, less like attachment to things, mm -hmm. uh, or less greediness, then maybe a little less enlightened than when I was there, just because the quality of concentration that you get when you're meditating 14 hours a day does lead to a very balanced quality of mind that I haven't found attainable yet outside mm. of the monastic setting. Mm. So there's so much stimulation for the more primal part of my brain in day-to-day -day life that it does get very easy for my um, the ego part of me to get caught up in wanting and desire. My practice these days is more learning to embrace that uh, rather than uh, try to subdue it as much uh, and not embrace it in a way that like I fuel it 
so that I get like really, really greedy. Mm -hmm. Um, but just to, again, going back to this thread, we already opened, uh, acknowledge it as a, a part of my humanness and also potentially as an important part of my humanness in the context that I'm in right now, mm -hmm. which is like being, uh, a human among other humans, having to have a job, having to make money, uh, and having to market myself. All of these things are just, um, you don't have to contend with that in the monastic setting. And so like, what does it actually mean to wake up, to be enlightened in the particular context you're in? That's a question I continue to ask myself and explore. I don't know if I have a good answer, but, um, I do, I do think I'm more awake, uh, than I was before just by virtue of, of staying with that inquiry in the context I'm in. Thank you for that explanation. That makes a lot of sense. You, mm -hmm. um, but you, I mean, you slept two, three hours a night mm -hmm. when you were doing that. Um, I mean, it sounded pretty grueling to me. Uh, there was a point where your back was in so much pain. You, you went and you're like, I'm going to piece the fuck out. And then the, 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 the monk was like, no, you're not. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah. Well, he, his response always was, uh, just be more present. It does. It really didn't matter what, what you, you did. Said. Yeah, you just you know, if there's so much pain. I think I'm going to leave. Just be more present. Um, like the the noise is so loud with the roof workers on the on the roof. Like I, I can't deal with this. Just be more present. Um, uh, this I had just had this amazing enlightening experience. Just be more present. And so it was it was always to cultivate this quality of equanimity with whatever experience arose, which in that context was the path to um, greater peace and, and enlightenment. Um, but yes, that the early, the first week of that retreat was extreme, grueling physical pain to mm -hmm. the point of wanting to leave after six days. Mm -hmm. And that's, it was through that struggle that, uh, I had my first big insight, which was, uh, the distinction of primary pain versus secondary pain, yeah. um, where, right. I'd be sitting down, the physical pain was there and most of the time, like the thought, okay, just be more present. So I'd bring my presence to the pain and I'd be like, this is not working. This is stupid. It makes the pain more worse. I want to get out of here. No way I could do this for six months. But then I started catching those thoughts that were coming up. So there's a physical pain, then the thoughts about the physical pain. What was interesting is that those thoughts would then trigger the emotions, which most of us in the psychology world are familiar with, right? Mm -hmm. Negative thoughts come up and then it triggers these negative emotions, uh -huh. um, anger, fear, frustration. But the real interesting piece that I had not ever seen before was that those emotions were actually making the physical pain worse. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that there was a relationship between um, the emotional body and the, like the sensational body, uh, if that's one way we could put it. So I, I just saw this insidious mental loop, right? There was physical pain, triggered the thoughts, mm -hmm. thoughts triggered the emotions, and the emotions made the pain worse. And it was it was being able to see that there were two forms of pain, the physical pain, but then all the thoughts, the emotions I was kicking on top of it that I, I found, oh, I actually might have some influence over how much I was suffering. The the cliche we often hear is that, you know, um, pain is inevitable, su the suffering is optional. Uh, I think that's a little strong because sometimes the, the... Can pain be optional too? Can I, can I, <laughs> what, can, can I make both optional? Yeah. So tell me, where's that, where's that inquiry coming from? The guy, the, the monk who lit himself on fire because oh, yeah. uh, he didn't seem to look like he was in, even in pain. Yes. Uh, and I would, I would agree that he wasn't in pain. So I, the one thing I have, do you seen, know what I mean? Yeah. Oh, totally. I, and, um, this is, this is where a lot of people will see that. And it's just so hard to wrap your head around. Yeah. But when you're meditating that deeply and when your concentration gets that deep, you, uh, the mind gets to a point where it can literally observe any sensational experience, mm. any aspect of your sense experience and hold it with equanimity. Mm. It's just like, oh, wow, there's heat right now. There's tension right now. And that's so hard to fathom what that would be like, um, right, when we, we don't have that training. But I do, I mean, right, in, in the monastery there, it was often 106 degrees, which isn't like being uh, lit on fire. But the the concrete walkways would get very, very hot. And I remember when I first got there, like uh, five days in, I took my sandals off to walk on the concrete because I wanted to be more grounded. And uh, 
And I, I could hardly do it for more than 15 seconds without my feet just feeling like they were burning. Uh, so I didn't do that again. And then three months went by and I started getting interested in exploring, like being with discomfort a little bit more, creating more discomfort to see how it would react to it. And uh, it was a hotter time of the year. The concrete was hotter than it was before. And I remember walking on it and actually being able to tolerate it. Um, and not just tolerate it, but almost be like, not feel any of the emotional impact that I felt before the fear, uh, and the pain itself wasn't as intense. So that was like a small dose of seeing what the mind is capable of in relationship to experiences that we typically think there's no way we could possibly be with them. Um, but that kind of, uh, this is what I'll just say, like, uh, about my general thoughts of that level of uh, concentration and enlightenment. Um, to get to that depth requires such a well-trained mind and almost being, I hate to say disconnected from your your bodily experience, but you're, you're in another space of awareness that I just found it very difficult to interact with people um, that uh, in like a day-to-day -day setting uh, that weren't in that kind of that level of awakening or awareness um, that I first noticed when I came back from Burma, I was actually better able to help my students uh, a year after getting back from Burma because I could more identify with like the mind that they were in. Uh, whereas before then there was just such a separation from the depth of practice I was in and where they were that it was, it was harder to connect if, if we could say that. Uh, does that make sense? It makes a lot of sense. Okay. It's uh, very interesting to me. I'm starting to think of from like a, a learning uh, perspective. Do we learn, do we over time learn that certain labels we've used are associated with certain sensations, like, uh, you know, sort of like linguistic categories, and that some of this process is unlearning those categories and treating every sensation as a new, um, yeah. uh, uh, detached from any sort of uh, rubricizing, as Maslow would put it, you know, I, I uh, you know, ticking or cutting, you know, uh, like, like, like coordinating off certain things is, oh, well, that's pain. Oh, that's pain. Oh, that's, that, that's, you know, happiness. That's what happiness feels like. Oh, that's what sadness feels like. But it's kind of like retraining that. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just throwing some stuff out there. Yeah. When you think of the retraining it, what, what are we retraining? Is it simply the decoupling of yeah. the label from the emotion? Yeah. Or the yeah, absolutely. So it's just like, oh, like, oh, that's a feeling, but it's yeah. like, you know, I'm not going to like put a label on it just yet. And in a lot of ways, it's the exact opposite of the emotional intelligence approach that I had last episode with mm -hmm. Mark Brackett, where his whole thing is like having people learn how to label precisely their emotions. And I almost wonder, it just I'm just thinking now, what, what, what's better actually, his approach or the mindfulness approach? Yeah, I I think both are incredibly important, well, that, and I think that that's inform, integration. <laughs> yeah, right. That's the integration, um, especially when working with trauma. I'm not sure if Mark talked about this, but a, a key did. thing is yeah. So being able to use that part of your brain that um, more the prefrontal cortex, he would be able to speak to it more intelligently than I could mm. um, to help that to right. And when we're resolving trauma, those emotions and those sensations just feel so soupy mm -hmm. and they're not well integrated in the part of our, our brain that can reason, that can understand, that can think through it. And so a big piece of that is as those emotions come up, being able to discern like, what actually is this rather than this soupy feeling that doesn't have any boundaries, that's very disorienting and maybe is okay when you're sitting in a monastic setting and you don't have to get anywhere or do anything or really be anyone. But in the real world, being able to have like a coherent sense of self mm. that has some boundaries, um, that knows what an emotion is or what I'm feeling <laughs> right now is incredibly important. Okay. Um, and what I will say is, is in the monastery, the practice we were doing we uh, is a labeling practice, oh, which see. means whatever is coming up, you're you're labeling it for what it is. Mm. So as soon as the eyes open, the first thing in the morning when you wake up, you're going eyes opening, eyes opening. If you're feeling sleepy, you might note fatigue, fatigue. It's a mental note in your head, but the idea is to show that in each moment there's an experience and then there's the awareness of the experience. So it's a way that we track our moment to moment experience without um, 
uh, without losing an awareness, but also to see it precisely for what it is uh, rather than letting it proliferate into something else. So when the pain comes up, being able to name it as pain or heat mm. or tingling, which then prevents it from going into, oh, I hate this pain. I can't be with this pain. And if those thoughts come up, then you just label those as thoughts. But it, you could get more granular with it. And if there's fear, you label fear. If there's sadness, you label sadness. So I think that uh, um, packaging of it psychologically uh, is a very important aspect to not being controlled by the experience and to s- hmm. And to start creating some boundaries around it uh, so that we're not just blindly swept away by it. So my label of that noise was annoying piece of shit. Now you're saying uh, <laughs> I shouldn't, I should just listen to the sound and. Uh... <laughs> yeah, it's still going on on my end. And that's like, that's my initial response as well. Um, oh, there it is. So if, so if you're a monk, you're like, oh, that's a beautiful sound. (laughs) Not quite. Okay. Um, But maybe uh, it, it all depends on kind of what our intentions are. When there was, there was about a month long, no, I said three week long period uh, in Burma where they were redoing the roof Mm -hmm. and where we meditated was on the top floor right next to the roof and it was open door. So you heard anything that happened outside Uh, And starting from 8 a.m. every morning until around 4 p.m., you just hear this hammering on the roof as loud as you can imagine. People talking all while you're you're meditating, doing this really deep work of trying to concentrate and practice. And the instructions in those in that setting with that practice is you're you're bringing your attention to your breath when the mind wanders you bring it back to the breath but if there's an experience that is more vivid and really catching your attention you bring your awareness to that uh, so I spent a few weeks just listening to and uh, holding with awareness this very obnoxious sound of the roof workers mm. hammering the roof talking to each other making jokes mm. And it, the the powerful thing about it was starting to see that the sound wasn't doing anything to annoy me. It mm. didn't have an agenda no, to no. ruin my day or my life or my meditation. It was just doing it, its only thing, which is to make sound. That's the, the nature of that experience. And everything has its own nature. Uh, so giving, giving that experience the space to be what it was and not create an issue out of it has absolutely translated uh, transferred into my own life to see when I'm caught in these things that I originally perceive as making an issue for me, uh, I don't have to fuel that thought process. And if I want to fuel it, I can. Sometimes there are contexts where it feels more important to like feel that threat of anger. Uh, I, I think especially in relationship to other people mm-hmm. where somebody's saying something that is rude, I could take the perspective that, okay, uh, what I'm feeling right now is just an emotion of rude, uh, anger, uh, and I could let it come, let it go if I want to. Um, but I think for deepening connection, it actually requires being more uh, attuned to and honoring and connecting through the emotion rather than in spite of the emotion. So I'll actually bring that into the connection more and say, actually, what you just said really made me angry right now. Uh, and and mm. I actually I won't stand for that or I don't like when you speak I'm to sorry, me. sorry, Corey. Yeah. Scott, I don't know if you've ever made me angry. I mean, there's space for that in our relationship if it comes up, but don't yeah. ever make me angry though. No, it's, it's all it's unidirectional. <laughs> Fair. <laughs> I'm joking. I'm joking. I know you are. Just wanted to take this moment to thank you all for your support of the podcast over the years. If you'd like to further support the podcast, I wanted to let you know a few things you could do to help make this podcast a better experience for you all. First, I'd really appreciate it if you could subscribe to the Psychology Podcast on iTunes. This would help make the show more prominent on iTunes and increase our listenership. I believe you can subscribe both on your iPhone and on your computer. Second, it'd be great if you could subscribe to our YouTube channel, where you'll find videos of many of these conversations. Just search for The Psychology Podcast on YouTube. Third, it'd be great if you could give the show a rating and review on iTunes. I definitely read all the reviews and they're helpful to others who are thinking about giving the show a listen. Finally, if you really want to show some love, you can donate something to the show. 
Even just the price of a cup of coffee would really help me continue to do this podcast for you all. To donate something, you can go to thepsychologypodcast.com and click on the link at the bottom that says Become a Sponsor. Thanks again for your incredible support of the show over the years. I do this show for you all because I truly love sharing my enthusiasm and love of the mind, brain, and creativity, and I really appreciate you joining me on this journey. Okay, now back to the show. Well, um, really great points. You're making really great points. And I, I don't know, sometimes if I have a headache, I, I meditate and I, and I really get as close as I can, just like zoom in on the pain of the headache. Um, sometimes my headache goes away. And I find that a fascinating phenomenon. I mean, I know that the all the all the meditation people will be like, what you did is you changed the, your relationship to the headache. But it's like, okay, whatever. But I, I don't actually feel it, <laughs> you know, like, right. so, I mean, that is to me the most fascinating thing. Like, it's not that I just changed my relationship to it. It's like, um, it's like, no, the, the actual sensation went away and I'm trying to understand what, how that's possible. Yeah, I am too. Uh, I don't know. I mean, you'd, you'd be more familiar with, I'm sure, the research on all of this. Uh, I haven't seen anything that come out that's come out that's answered my question around that. But when when we're talking about acceptance, yeah. a lot of people and, and its relationship to well-being, a lot of people perceive it in the way that I think you initially perceived it, which is that, OK, I'm not fighting the experience anymore. I just kind of allow it to be here. Yeah. But it almost that almost it, uh, communicates this idea that the experience is still there. We're just not like pushing against it. And sometimes that's true. But in my experience, what immediately happens as soon as you stop pushing against mm. it on the most subtle level, the experience transforms, it changes. Mm. And with deeper meditation, um, experiences can arise like physical pain. And as soon as you bring your attention to those experiences, they completely evaporate and they dissolve. Yeah. And, and that's really fascinating to me. Um, I mean, if we get really deep here, maybe the headache thing is just a metaphor for life. So people, like everything has its own sort of nature that wants to be expressed and uh, sort of laws of, uh, we have no free will, right? So it's a laws of, you know, of, uh, of, of that was set out by the Big Bang. And like the more that you like, try to, the more you come in contact and try to change it, the more it's going to naturally resist. So there are situations where you, certainly you, you, you want to resist something, but it's about finding a way of getting away f- of, of like letting it do its thing, but you not being affected by it Yeah. either physically or mentally. So sometimes that might be figuring out a way to kindly tell someone, you know, Hey, you know, if you're on a phone conversation with someone who's just won't stop talking for two hours and you're just like exhausted, you know, and you don't want to hurt their feelings. You don't want to push against that, you know, but be like, you know, um, hey, this has just been so valuable to hear your perspective. And I just want you to know I'm there for you, but I need to go to bed now. <laughs> you know, like, I don't know. What do you think about what I just what, said? Well, I, one, I think you do that very well because you've done that with me a handful of times where we're like mm-hmm. in these interesting conversations and you fully acknowledge it and you're like, oh, I actually have to get to sleep right now or something yeah. like that. <laughs> or I'm really sick. I need a nap. Mm-hmm. Um, so you do that. You do that better I'm than most people. I better know. than I used to be, because when I was in college or grad school, I was known by my best friend, Ben, to um, he would know he would see it coming. I'd be like you're done. <laughs> it would get to a point where like, he's like nap time. I'm like, yeah, nap time. You're done. And it like, I was known for that. So I, I've well, been, I've been trying to be a lot more uh, kinder in my, uh, in saying that. Yeah. Yeah. You're doing it gracefully. And so uh, to, to chap- a better effect. Yeah. 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 Chapter five. So I talk about four pillars of presence in the book, focus, allowing curiosity and embodiment. And this most relates to the allowing pillar of presence. Um, which is developing the container to hold the many dimensions of our experience with, uh, and at least getting to a point where we don't an- immediately need to get rid of them, which most of us are trying to find happiness by uh, pushing at, at the expense of um, mm. certain experiences. So the, the counterintuitive approach there is like actually first, or one thing we can deepen into is developing the inner container that can hold the many dimensions of ourselves doesn't mean we have to stay in each of those dimensions, but just having that capacity allows us to uh, feel and experience more integration and wholeness. But 
the the subtopic within that thread is, uh, but I can't just allow everything, right? Because mm. people then think, well, am I just going to like passively resign to life? Or if my child is ruining their life with drugs, am I just supposed to say, okay, well, that's just, just going to have to allow it to happen. Right. Or we notice injustices around us. Just let that happen. And the, the, this allowing pillar and equanimity, which is the mind state that's often spoken about with this, uh, is more about our internal experience than it is our external experience. Mm. Um, and so to allow, um, uh, we can allow the desire for boundary. Mm. We can allow the desire, like curiosity. We can allow anger. Um, it doesn't mean that we have to follow that thread. It just means that we can at least acknowledge this dimension of our humanness and see it there and make space for it. If it feels appropriate in that context or be able to set a boundary internally around it and go, okay, not right now. Um, but when it comes to external experiences, let's say we say, okay, I should just allow my child to, uh, ruin their life with drugs. This is a complicated one because sometimes we need to let someone just walk their own path and we can't do any intervening. Um, but if we just said, all right, I'm just going to allow it because Corey said I need to allow it. Well, that also might mean that we're disallowing a part of us that has, a uh, a uh, um, our heart or our uh, mm. value to help this person. Mm. So allowing externally is, is different than allowing internally. And I think is more akin to passive resignation as many people would, would think I'm more interested in the internal experience of allowing. How does that relate to the pain box? The pain box. Okay. So the, the, (laughs) I think it does relate. Yeah, Yeah. it, it, it does. So the pain box This is your phrase, right? This is Corey's phrase. I like giving people credit. Yeah. 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 This idea has been spoken about in different ways, but, um, the first chapter is titled being human is hard and Mm. talks about the various traumas of life that develop these walls that prevent us from experiencing different parts of ourselves, different, uh, emotions, whether it's joy or vulnerability, Mm. um, over time, we learn like what's safe to experience and what's not safe to experience. And that ends up confining us into a, a smaller way of living uh, that I call living within the pain box. It's called the pain box because the walls are made out of pain. There are no actual concrete slabs that we need to break through or get through. It's just the perceived pain that I might have to experience if I try and get to where I'm trying to get. So an example of that is maybe where we're trying to embody um, a little more authenticity, uh, which is a complicated word, but let's just say it's like being able to honor our present moment experience. Um, but that might require experiencing a sense of shame around something. Mm-hmm. And we might go, Oh, last time I felt shame, like it w- w- was way too painful. So I don't want to experience that. Mm-hmm. So the, the shame becomes a wall to experiencing authenticity or the pain of experiencing that shame. So as it relates to uh, the allowing pillar of presence mm. to these walls don't get softened by like ramming through them or breaking them down or trying to jump over them. They only get softened by, uh, meeting them. Or I won't say only there, there might be other ways, but the main way I've seen them soften is when they're met with kindness, when they're met with presence and awareness, uh, and seen as also an integral part of, um, of who we are. These walls are trying to protect us. Yeah. They're saying like, Hey, last time you experienced this, it was really uncomfortable. And I don't want you to have to experience that again. So when we can, when we can see the heart behind the wall, we can learn to love the wall and hold it with awareness. Then the wall feels safe enough to, to soften and let go. And that's where I see profound integration in my students uh, and where they actually start making real big, meaningful shifts. It's when they befriend that wall, this thing that they perceive as an enemy that they have to break through or jump over or get rid of or suppress. Uh, when they see the wisdom in it, hold it with presence, allow it to be there, then it organically softens. Mm, I love that. Mm. Um, it, like the headache. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. And, and yeah, go on. It's specific for people that might be curious if you're working through something yourself and like, what does this actually look like? Um, just contemplate anything in your life that you want more of, uh, connection, love, uh, even success, however you define that. And then reflect on, um, 
what what do you perceive gets in the way of you getting there? What is the discomfort that comes up when you perceive trying to get these things? Mm -hmm. Whatever that discomfort is, is going to be most closely associated with your pain wall. And you can do a meditation practice where you imagine yourself trying to get to that thing um, and experiencing that pain wall when it comes up. And when it does come up, uh, just practice allowing it to be there. And you can even, you can even personify it, give it a shape and a color and say, Hey, you know, it's, it's nice to meet you. I'm not here to get rid of you. I just want to learn like, what your positive intention is. How are you trying to serve me? How are you trying to help me? There's a very good chance that part of you will, uh, it'll be such a breath of fresh air for it to be seen and acknowledged rather than constantly, uh, uh, mm-hmm having the usual experience of trying to be suppressed. So it's just a process of making friends with all dimensions of yourself, including those parts we most resent. Hey everyone, I'm pleased to announce a new sponsor of the show, Prolific. Prolific is a high quality research service that helps researchers find participants for their studies on demand. Prolific has a pool of 75,000 active participants in North America and Europe. My colleagues and I have had great experiences using Prolific. In fact, we've used it for the past couple of years in studying our white versus dark triad um, test. And we found it really easy to select the types of participants we wanted to include, and we were really impressed by how high quality the data turned out to be. It was clear that the participants took our study very seriously, which is also something really great in comparison to some of the alternatives out there, such as Amazon's Mechanical Turk. Um, actually, there's quite a few reasons why Prolific is better than uh, the alternatives. For one, Prolific is the only platform that lets you collect samples that are nationally representative of the U.S. or U.K. at the click of a button. This is a real game changer because it makes representative sampling more accessible to research labs around the world and also because it makes psychology research more generalizable. Also, Prolific distributes studies evenly across participants, so there's less of a problem with professional survey takers. They even monitor their data and any feedback that they get from researchers and participants, they take seriously um, and they do this to make sure that they catch any bad actors. I also really like that their survey takers are regular citizens and you can quickly recruit a wide range of demographics, such as Democrats and Republicans, African Americans, young people, old people, students, etc., all on demand. Third, Prolific makes it really easy to run longitudinal or follow-up studies. It's typically very difficult to run a study that tracks participants over time, but since the prolific participants are so diligent, they have a really low attrition rate. In fact, on average, 86% of the prolific participants take part in follow-up studies. That's really quite awesome. So all in all, it's very clear that the good folks at Prolific care hugely about data quality. And I'm excited to announce that we have a great deal today just for listeners of the Psychology Podcast. You can get $50 in free Prolific credit by going to www.prolific.co forward slash the psychology podcast. So go to that website to redeem $50 off. Only the first 100 researchers will get this freebie. And there are no strings attached other than setting up a 15-minute demo call with them so they can explain how the platform works. Again, for $50 in free Prolific credit, Go to www.prolific.co forward slash the psychology podcast. That's www.prolific.co forward slash the psychology podcast. Okay, now back to the show. So, just building off what you just said there, which I um, agree with whole, wholeheartedly. Mm. Um, you, uh, you see what I did there? Do you see what I did there? <laughs> yes, that was um, good. You have this thing in the in your book. You say, "But it, but if you knew the real me, dot dot dot." And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that because um, I've been really interested in dispelling uh, the myth of that there is such a thing as a real you. You know, mm. so I was wondering if you could kind of talk about because some people might say like, you know, I'm I'm scared of like getting too close to people. You know, because that seems like a real barrier to connection is like yes. afraid that someone's going to see the real you. Can can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. So there's. There's a whole um, section in the book on connection and intimacy. Um, and overrated, of, overrated. 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 <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking. Not really. I mean, I'm, you know, anyway, I'm being cheeky. Yes, yeah. I know. Um, so one of the ways I, I mean, I talk about intimacy beyond the usual uh, idea of sex and romance. Um, and it as 
this this experience you have when you feel like uh, you are truly seen and accepted. But the word that I focus on on in that is the you. And I say, well, what is this you? Who is this you? Because if we've been exploring up until this point in the whole book is that the you, as you're saying, Scott, has many different dimensions, many different parts. So what does it mean for you to be fully seen and accepted? Mm. Um, I, I know I, what that means now, but I didn't know like, you know, 10 years ago. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. So, um, so there might be some parts of us in connection with another person that we're fully uh, um, uh, okay with letting someone else see the part of us that's really successful and funny and happy. But maybe this other part that has a bad relationship with our mother, that's insecure, um, that doesn't really like going out on the weekends, whatever, we might feel like, oh, that's less okay. Me, me, me. <laughs> yeah, there it is. Oh, so the the depth of intimacy we can experience with another person. Yeah. This is my own theory. Uh, is directly related to the depth of intimacy we can experience with ourselves. I love that. Because oh, I love that it, so much. Yeah. yeah. Until we can start to feel okay with these parts of ourselves enough that we can say, Hey, this is like more of who I am. If we don't perceive that another person sees the deeper parts of us and accepts and mm. loves, uh, doesn't, ne doesn't necessarily need to love them, but at least accepts them. Mm. Then we're always going to have this sense that this person only like doesn't really love me, mm. uh, only loves part of me. And that's not always on the other person because some of us are so disconnected from ourselves that we don't even know the parts of us that we resent that we're not bringing to the other person. So true. And that's that's where the but if you knew the real me comes in the book and it shares this story about this couple um, and Chris and Jared and, and Jared would they had a great relationship but Jared always felt like Chris didn't really love and accept him and and Chris was like what are you talking about like I I we. We have this great relationship. I love you. And when we go deeper into it, Jared didn't even know um, like what it was he felt that mm -hmm. Chris didn't love about him. There was just a sense. And when I started doing more work with um, with Jared, it was very clear that he had a lot of parts of himself that he didn't love, that he didn't accept. That there you he go. There you go. And it, it wasn't until he could do that work of saying, oh, wow, there are these parts of me. Radical acceptance. Was, yes, that radical acceptance. <laughs> And first doing that himself, but then being able to bring that into the relationship then allowed Chris to also start to accept those parts. This is – it's touchy territory because you don't want to go like on your first Tinder date at McDonald's and say like, hey, here are all my demons and my shadow parts. Like this stuff we progress into. Isn't that the best place to do uh, it? <laughs> if there is a place to do it, do it on that. At dinner. McDonald's? Yeah. <laughs> but when you're eating it, like a greasy burger, I mean, that's, <laughs> you're already showing your dietary oh, your things, right? So it's like that's one step towards showing your shadow side. <laughs> yes. Um, it, it, so we acknowledge that um, that there may only be like a couple of people in your entire life that you do show the depth uh, of yourself too. And there's a container that gets created over time where we use some wise discernment around when does it feel appropriate to maybe bring more parts of myself in. Um, but as we do, I think anyone that, uh, and everyone's experiences to some extent within their relationships where they feel like that when they feel a little safer to be themselves, there is a sense of connection with that person yeah. and something in your nervous system softens and settles. And it's so rich and fulfilling and allows you to experience more of your wholeness. And, and since uh, this, this part got cut out of the book, but mm. since we're such tribal creatures and we depend so much on like a, other people's sense of ourselves as being okay um, for a, like a, a sense of like um, for a fundamental uh, sense of wholeness. Yeah, yeah. A sense of wholeness. Like that is actually really important. I think there are only certain stages of well-being that we can get to when we feel another person uh, accepts parts of us. And it might not be the whole tribe that accepts parts of us. Um, but our most intimate relationships, if there's a commitment to really, uh, really getting to know one another, that can deepen in a profound way. And the more parts of you that are brought in uh, and accepted, the more you feel that the wholeness of you is accepted and seen. And that that's a lifelong journey. And not every part has to be seen and accepted. But um, the more that are, the deeper that sense of wholeness and intimacy 
becomes. Thanks, Corey. That's why I try to, um, with my guests on the psychology, psychology podcast, I try to just let, you know, let, let, let my personality shine in no inhibited way. And yeah. so far, so good. <laughs> That's why people love you. <laughs> um, so um, technology can obviously be a double-edged sword. Uh, on the one hand, technology can um, bring out this uh, constant neediness to be liked by others. But in what ways is technology allowing us to be more mindful? Um, and do you have any sort of uh, leaving, you know, as we close our interview today, some recommendations of things people can do to uh, use technology to help them be more mindful, not less? Sure. Yeah. I, so technology is, is still an, it's a big area of interest uh, for me in terms of how we bring, um, presence to it and develop presence through it. And I think a lot of people in my space, the meditation space, um, focus a lot on healthy boundaries around technology, which is absolutely important. And I'm a big proponent of, um, but I also think we need to start addressing technology in the same way uh, as an extension of our humanness. Um, it, so just because we have negative thoughts doesn't mean that we would start campaigning against having brains. Uh, we have to learn to work with those negative thoughts and see them. And also when we focus on the good thoughts, the negative thoughts, just seeing like, okay, this is the, the part of the whole thing of what it means to have a brain. In the same way with technology, there's a lot of good and there's a lot of bad. We don't have to throw the baby out with the bathwater just because um, there's a lot of bad to it. So I'm in addition to creating those healthy parameters and designing technology ethically, mm -hmm. I do think we need to explore our own relationship to it. And this is where I have a whole uh, a series of meditations in the book um, that help us just be, develop a more intimate relationship to technology in such a way that we use it purposefully uh, and are not completely hijacked by it. So one of those meditations is it's very simple, but it's called the scroller coaster. Oh. And um, this is did where you, did you, who called it that? I did. Oh, that's cool. That's clever. <laughs> yeah, thanks. People have been into that one. Uh, so it, instead of being present without your phone, you be present with your phone. You could see it as a meditation practice. You open your phone, you open your favorite social media app, let's just say Instagram or Facebook. Uh, and then you start scrolling. So this is where the scroller coaster begins. You start going through and then it's like you see a cat and go, oh my gosh, I love cats. And then you see your friend got a job that you wanted. Oh, I hate that friend. And it, the highs and lows of the emotion. This is the roller coaster of emotions that we experience. So that's why it's called the scroller coaster. You start scrolling and then we feel the roller coaster. And usually we're Corey, going I'm always so proud of you <laughs> when you post things on. Oh, thank you. Am I doing it wrong? No, you're just Am like I, on the high end of the uh, roller coaster. Uh, okay, okay. <laughs> just coasting. <laughs> okay, go. Okay, go on. <laughs> um, so we usually do that process on automatic pilot, and those emotions just hijack us as they come through. Mm -hmm. I think taking a dedicated period of five minutes to explore what it's like to go through that, mm -hmm. uh, through the scroller coaster with more awareness. Uh, makes us more sensitive to when it comes up in future moments. So this isn't necessarily a meditation you do every day, uh, every day. And it's, I don't expect that all of us are going to bring that same quality of awareness to every time we're scrolling through our phones. But if someone listening to this right now, uh, after this is over, pulled out their phone, started scrolling through, but made it a meditation practice to watch what, what is your mind thinking about and what are you feeling and see if you can watch all of that shifting and changing without being so caught up in it. I think it would be really illuminating. It is yeah. really illuminating for anyone to see, wow, this has so much control over me. And also I don't have to be so uh, stuck in it on automatic pilot like I usually am. So it's just a little bit of awareness that we can gain in relationship to the technology. That's a great, great tip. Uh, <laughs> and I love the name of that. I really do. Um, Corey, is there anything uh, you, else you'd like to say? Or, you know, I, I don't often give uh, people, my guests, a chance to plug things because I just hate plugging. But yeah. I'm going to give you a chance right now because this is your first book. And um, I think it, I know how much it means to you. So can is there anything you want to talk about right now? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, the book is called Stop Messing Your Life, How to Be Deeply Present in an Unpresent World. Um, the book took a solid year and a half of writing and mm -hmm. went through a lot of iterations. Um, I originally wanted to call the book Deep Presence, 
And uh, well, then a bunch of people said this sounded like an 80s porno. I was like, okay, so can't market that. And then I wanted to call it permission to be human. And that really felt like it got at the heart of it. But they still didn't feel like that would, you know, when you're working with a publisher, they have their ideas of what's market marketable or not. And then they, then we went with stop missing your life. And I originally resisted it because it's not something that I would say to someone. I wouldn't ever say to my students, stop missing your life. Mm. But when I reflected more on, on the zeitgeist, the, the flavor of our culture right now, this feels like an, uh, an important way to communicate this message where our heads are down so frequently where, um, we're moving through the motions so quickly and many of us are so disconnected that it's almost like we need something that stands out, just mm-hmm. shakes us by the shoulders and says, like, stop, at least just stop, drop in. Mm-hmm. Um, and this this book it will take your hand on that journey of, of reconnecting to the pulse of your own life. What I love about it is that you can't get the whole book in chapter one. Each chapter builds progressively all the way to the very end when we're talking about technology, connection, intimacy. So, uh, I'm really excited for people to read it. Um, you can learn, you can get it anywhere books are sold, Amazon, Barnes and Noble, stop missing your life.com on the black market, on the black market. <laughs> and, uh, and for anyone that, um, I want, I'd love to give your listeners free resources. If you want uh, guided meditations, uh, app recommendations, like mindfulness starter kit, uh, anyone could just text their email address to plus one, six, three, one, four, zero, five, four, six, three, one. Uh, and you'll get a bunch of free stuff. So you don't need to buy the book. Try to memorize that. (laughs) Yeah. Six, three, one, four, zero, five, four, six, three, one. Yeah. And that's it. That's it. Got a daily podcast called practicing human. It's great. Um, uh, which you already talked about and otherwise just a big, big thank you to you, Scott. I love who you are in this world and, um, Mm. that you get to do it through such a great platform and our friendship. I'm so grateful for it. Uh, I think everyone's really lucky to to have you here guiding us into more self-actualization transcendence and, and just becoming good whole humans. Well, thank you, Corey. That's usually how my ending sounds. So I don't know what to, how to top that, but um, <laughs> thank you, Corey, for being on the show today and, uh, of course, being a, a dear friend. Um, but I um, just really wish you, I'm giving a good intention here, uh, wish you well on this uh, book journey here because it's, uh, uh, I know it's, it's, very well, it's very well deserved and I think it's, it'll help a lot of people. I like the book. In fact, my blurb is on the back <laughs> of the book. I'm going to read my blurb. Um, right. This down-to-earth queer and compassionate book is one of the best distillations of the benefits of mindfulness I've ever read. It will help you savor the good in your life as well as bring out the immense good that already lies within you. Stop missing the wonder, beauty, and connection in your life and read this book right now. (laughs) Thanks again, Corey, for being on the show. Thanks, Scott. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Psychology Podcast. If you'd like to react in some way to something you heard, I encourage you to join in the discussion below. Also, please add a rating and review of the podcast on iTunes, and subscribe to the Psychology Podcast YouTube channel, as we're really trying to increase our viewership on YouTube. Thanks for being such a great supporter of this podcast, and be sure to tune in next time for more on the mind, brain, behavior, and creativity.